welcome to another session of TMYS Academy, where we're we'll working towards building a digital knowledge bank, which initiates a cross-country, cross-culture, and cross-discipline learning exchange with global thought leaders. Today, we have with us Professor Jaswinder Bolina, who is a poet and an essayist. He teaches on the faculty of the University of Miami's MFA program in creative writing. His most recent collection of poems, the 44th of July, was named a finalist for the Big Other Book Award in 2019 and was longlisted for the 2019 Pen America Open Book Award. Another collection of his called Phantom Camera was the winner of the 2012 Green Rose Prize in Poetry and the collection Carrier Wave was the winner of the 2006 Colorado Prize for Poetry. You can read some of his essays and poems online on platforms like the Poetry Foundation, the Pinwheel Journal, the Walter, etc. And um, thank you for joining us today, Mr. Bolina. We welcome you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, just a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Ritambara, and I'm going to be moderating the session. Some of my interests include children's literature, translation, the intersection of text and images, text and music. And um, before I go to graduate school in a year or two, hopefully, <laughs> I'm going to do a capstone thesis on uh, Amruta Patel's graphic novels under Professor Gil Harris. Mm -hmm. And um, now, without further ado, let's get started. So, uh, Professor, my first question to you is, you have very, your collections have very American names. So there's the tallest building in America, there's the 44th of July, which I presume is a spin on the 4th of July. And um, at the same time, many of your essays and poems talk about xenophobia, race, and diasporic identities. So I'm curious to know as to how you reconcile your two identities. Do you even consider your identity dual? Are you wary of being labeled, say, as a minority writer or a writer of color? Or do you welcome these labels or perhaps even actively engage with them? So on a personal level, where do you place yourself and how do you navigate identity politics? So I actually just uh, this June, my first collection of essays came out um, called Of Color and it, it very much delves deeply into um, this exact question of identity. Um, in the US, as many will likely know, um, we use this phrase, a person of color to designate somebody who is in some way minority. Um, as determined by, by skin color. Um, and in some of those essays, I, I very much um, tackle this question. One of my, my first essay that ever kind of circulated widely was called Writing Like a White Guy. And it was um, engaging this notion that if you did not see my name, you may not know necessarily that I was uh, you know, from elsewhere because my language is so determined by where I was born and raised, of course. Um, and so you can hear from my voice too. I, I have a perfectly neutral kind of Midwestern American accent. Um, and I was born in Chicago and raised here. And there is, um, in the collection of essays, I, 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 I think quite a lot about this question of identity and, and try to be as honest as possible about um, the consequences of being a person of color raised in this country where my family still, we, we use the term American to mean a white person, a white native born person um, who is uh, American, right? And we, we, that's always been the case. Um, and, and it was in fact kind of derogatory when you, when you were growing up, you know, your mother or somebody or some relative would say, if you got a little too cocky or something, American banana, you know, he's too, he's too American. And, um, and so I, it was, and yet at the same time, we were encouraged to assimilate as much as possible because um, there are the, the socioeconomic pressures, right? You, your family knows as immigrants, you're not going to become president of the United States or president of a big bank or something. Certainly not when my family came over in the 60s and 70s. Um, you're not going to necessarily be somebody if you don't fit in in some way. Um, and so they, I was sort of doubly encouraged to attempt to fit in, but not too much, you know, uh, because they didn't want me to lose touch with my culture. Um, so my essays, um, the, the essay collection has 10 essays in it, and they all kind of, you know, uh, orbit this question. Um, as far as the, 
your question now, I would say that my identity is very much a, a dual identity, but it, it has changed over my lifetime. You know, when I was younger and, and felt that sort of teenage pressure to fit in, I wanted to be regarded as everybody else. And as you grow up here, you realize no matter what you do, no matter what clothes you wear, no matter how you speak, no matter how, who you hang out with, you're always going to be treated as different. Um, and so that was something that, you know, in fits and starts and different ways over many years, decades, um, I, I have tried to grapple with in myself. Um, I'm sure every other person in my family and others have dealt with it as well. And we all deal with it we cope with it differently. You know, sometimes um, there are those who very much embrace American identity. There are those who appear to embrace American identity, but then double back. And next time you see them, my family's sick and jumpy. Next time you see them, they they have fog and, and naughty. And you're like, what happened to that guy? You know, and it was somewhere in there. You hadn't seen him in five years and he had a, you know, a, a change of heart or something. Um, and there are others, you know, who uh, find ourselves very much in the middle where, um, I speak Punjabi, I can understand some Hindi and, um, and Urdu, but, uh, you know, I, my, my, mother, my mother taught me to, to make sabji and I, you know, I can cook for myself. So I have this sort of connection um, in, a, in a day to day uh, sense to my heritage. Um, and it's very deeply ingrained. It doesn't go away. Um, you know, even when I walk into the Asia grocery here in Miami, I just the smell of the haldi and things like that, they make me feel, you know, homesick right away. And, um, and whenever I'm cooking, I, I remember being, you know, in my parents' house growing up. Um, and yet at the same time, uh, you know, I have married an American. I have married a, a person who is um, of European uh, extraction and born and raised here. Um, and I have grown up here. It is very much my, my home. Um, uh, much more so than India could be because uh, India is just a country that I don't really know. Um, so I, I, at end, my identity, I think, is very much a dual one, um, but I don't claim that duality with any kind of authority. I'm not saying that this is the way it should be done or that I'm doing it correctly. Um, I'm just doing the best I can. And, um, and so the poems um, and uh, the essays as well especially in the poetry, increasingly as I've gotten older, they have started, I've tried to sort of figure out how best to bring that duality to the page, um, which I wasn't able to do, I don't think as well when I was younger. And yet um, friends, other poets um, have identified that, that it was there the entire time, whether I was aware of it or not. Um, so it's, it's interesting. Um, be on the inside, you, you never know how you're being perceived. But yeah, I hope that answers some of your question. It certainly does. And uh, it's interesting that you mentioned writing like a white guy, because um, that's my next question. You say that assimilation is a destructive rather than a constructive process. And what I notice in your work is rather than assimilating yourself to a culture as a person of color, you sort of insert yourself into it. For example, in Pornograph with Americana, a very delightful poem of yours that I absolutely love, by the way, you insert yourself through language. So your lover is called Apna, you evoke Vahiguru, you talk about lehengas and kurtas. So um, do you view language as inherently exclusionary or inclusionary? I mean, mm. it of course isn't as strict a binary as that, of course, but... Um, how do you view language? Do you think it's a tool that shapes culture? Do you think language and culture sort of nurture each other? Um, your views? Yeah, so, um, so let me start in kind of an unusual spot. I, in, as an undergraduate, um, was a philosophy major. Um, I didn't study literature. I mean, I, I, I did almost have a dual degree, but I didn't quite finish the English portion of it. Um, and so when I, I remember my, I was drawn very much in philosophy to linguistic philosophers like uh, Wittgenstein and Heidegger, these um, Germans who are very interested in language. Um, so Sear, the French um, linguist, um, there, Heidegger himself was a terrible person. He was a Nazi and all kinds of things, but he, he has this very um, famous, I think, quote, uh, we don't speak language, language speaks us, you know, and, um, and I think that 
that taught me something many, many years ago that I didn't realize um, would become applied in, you know, in such a direct way in my, in my own writing. I didn't know that I would become a writer when I first encountered this idea. Um, but I think that language um, is very much an artifact of the culture from which it comes. Um, and in that sense, it, it has, it does speak us, as, as Heidegger says, it can be totalizing. And it, it, there's a way in which it controls your thought. Um, there's the, the very famous and very apocryphal, this is not, it turns out true, but you get told this as sort of an urban legend that um, the Inuit people in uh, Canada, in Northern Canada, have 40 different words for snow because they encounter so much different kinds of snow and, and where we only have one word for it. And yet, you know, uh, whether that's exactly true or not, um, you understand the analogy. It's sort of saying that um, that version of language says, well, experience then determines language, right? They encounter different kinds of snow, so they have different kinds of words for it where there's this alternative theory that says, um, no, in fact, language is a, a sort of uh, heritage from the, that you are kind of embedded into when you are born into a culture. Um, and in that context, your thinking, your perspective on the world is determined by the words that are available to you. Um, and that is a very um, different sort of view. And I, and I think that the, the, the truth is obviously somewhere in the middle, right? That um, there's a way in which, yes, experience is going to dictate how a culture speaks about a subject. Um, but I don't think language is one monolithic and I don't think it's static. I think that um, each and every one of us has the power to uh, shape it, to, to move it one way or the other. So the English language, um, sort of thankfully for my purposes as a poet is an incredibly plastic language. It's, it's, a, it's a hungry, it's a scavenging language. It, it, it just steals from everybody and it feels completely natural, much more so than, um, you know, Spanish or Hindi or Punjabi. I remember, you know, watching now when my, growing up, my mother would watch Bollywood movies, my whole family would, and, um, and everything was strictly Hindi or Punjabi, right? And now you watch, and I, I was just astonished going home, a, you know, a year or two ago, um, and my mom was watching some movie, and I said, half this movie's in English. They're all speaking English. It's sort of like English has this strange uh, tenacity. It, it, it invades and it infiltrates, much like the English people. Um, but we, uh, I think as a consequence of its ability to be so flexible, an individual can exert a little bit of pressure on it. And, and there I go to more kind of physical analogies, the way that um, a much smaller boat, like a tugboat can push a much larger boat with just a, you know, a little bit of exertion or um, in uh, you know, cosmology and astrophysics, you know that a very small object can exert just a little bit of gravity on a much larger object and, and affect its course over uh, you know, a long enough, um, uh, space. And so I think that for me, um, English is a, is a language that controls thought, but an individual can then push back by doing the kinds of things that I do in that poem that you um, cite, which is my attitude has always been, well, this is part of my language. Linga, corta, all these words are, you know, everything is part of my understanding. And if I can contain these words in my mind alongside ordinary English, um, why can't other people? So why can't I sort of introduce those words into my poetry? And in that poem, it's a very, very deliberate um, idea uh, because I, I'm taking, you know, Americana, this idea of like very American um, imagery, uh, but then trying to revise it and reimagine it with um, you know, a completely invented story. This never happened to me. I never did these things being described in the poem. Um, although, you know, in, in many ways, wouldn't it be nice? But, um, but uh, you know, but it's a story about two teenagers. The teenagers happen to be desi, right? And they have very desi characteristics and they're, but they're engaged in very kind of American kinds of mischief. Um, and I, I did that very deliberately because I wanted 
a white American audience to kind of recalibrate how they view um, Desi characters, not as exoticized or as obedient or as whatever, uh, you know, model minority kind of uh, myths that exist here. Um, and I also wanted for Desi readers to read this poem and say, ah, finally, somebody's acknowledging that we have these uh, impulses and desires and, um, and bad behaviors too. And so uh, that story in the poem is not true, but many of the other the behaviors obviously are ones that I have some familiar, familiarity with that are being described in the poem, just not that exact story, you know? And so the idea was um, if I can um, bring a reality to that, the way that I'm gonna be able to do this is by introducing, by, by juxtaposing the languages, by bringing in the Punjabi and um, sort of allowing it to exert some gravitational pull on English and or it's a little bit of push back. Um, and so I, I think of language very much as um, as a kind of um, authoritative force, but one that can be very easily undermined if, if you put your mind to it. Um, so I thought that was really clever and very subtly funny, and honestly really refreshing the way you talk about immigration. And I anyway wanted to talk about the airy, the light, almost playful way in which um, politics finds space in your poems. So you say that this was deliberate, but um, do you, would you say that you consciously try to um, diverge from the existing narrative on uh, immigration and race and um, so other such themes? Or yeah, yeah, no, those, those themes very much show up in uh, the 44th of July. They, um, it's become more and more conscious and more and more deliberate uh, over through the course of the books that I'm working on. Um, I'm sorry, that I have worked on. Um, and the, the playfulness is also very intentional. I, I, I think when I was growing up, I, and even now, I, 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 I'm kind of my personality wise, I like to have fun. I, I can be fun. I, I like to crack jokes, things like that. But I also, my interiority was very somber and very serious. You know, I, I think, um, I remember my parents would say, they would have uh, meetings with the teachers at school and they would say, he's always so serious. He doesn't seem to have fun. And I, such a strange thing, but I just had that kind of personality and, and, and in many ways still do on the inside somewhere. Um, and so I, I became aware of that at some point in high school or college that I was kind of, a, you know, a mopey person, a mopey melancholy personality. And, um, and I found myself eventually getting very tired of reading that in other people's work. And I, I didn't want that reflected out um, because it occurred to me that the, the world is not so singular in tone, right? We, um, we, things will happen to us and it seems like the center of the universe. And yet, of course, it absolutely is not. Uh, there is, on the day that I die, somebody is going to, you know, um, go through a, a, a drive through at the Taco Bell and order a, a horrible, you know, fast food uh, taco and somebody else is going to trip and fall down the stairs and all their friends will laugh at them. And, um, and you know, somebody at the, at the funeral will, uh, you know, pass gas or something or, you know, sneeze at an inappropriate moment. All these things are happening simultaneously. And so in the poems, I, I try to capture some of that juxtaposition that, um, that there are serious things, that immigration is a, is a very big and heavy topic, especially here in the States, especially with the current president. Um, and and as, as fraught as the subject is, as much pain and anguish and, and, and conflict uh, as there is around, there, uh, around that subject, um, all of us are still living our lives and our lives are still very manifold and have a lot of different um, tones and textures to them. And so um, I want to bring all of that in and, and the way that I attempt to do that is to sometimes, I try to, um, if there is lightness, it might come from the way in which I try to undermine um, the expectation of the reader that, hey, we're going to be talking about this topic, so that maybe they're expecting it to go this way. 
but then what if all of a sudden um, the, uh, the speaker is not from another country, they're from another planet? You know, let me do something like that. Let me introduce a completely different idea of, um, of, of how, what being alien looks like. Um, and so the politics, all of those things, I constantly, I think, have this desire to, um, to just undercut, undercut the, the expectations of the reader. So um, essentially you like playing with your writing. Um, yeah, I do, yeah. Yeah, no, go ahead. No, 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 I do. It's, it's just, it's, it's fun. I mean, I, it, I, I had a, a wonderful um, professor as an undergraduate, a poet um, uh, by the name of Dean Young, who is, um, who is an extraordinary poet, an American poet. Um, and he, I remember he, him saying to our workshop, our class uh, one day, one of the, I took multiple classes with him, but I don't remember which class this was, but he said, there are two kinds of poets in this classroom. Uh, and some are the, uh, I fall upon the thorns of life and I bleed type poets. And the other guys are like having conversations with like Daffy Duck and like, you know, being kind of just this weird, goofy. Uh, and I think I was somewhere right in the middle. Like I kind of had this uh, tendency towards the more serious dramatic stuff, but I wanted to be the other kind of poet. I wanted to be a little bit lighter and more fun. Um, and that's all that I've ca tried to keep in mind is that um, it's not life or death. It, it can be extremely profound and poignant poetry, but, um, but we're also not performing open heart surgery here. And so why not have a little bit of fun? And, and I'd suspect even the best surgeons have a good sense of humor, you know? And so maybe it's okay for poets to have that too. Okay, so uh, poetry, at least the way I understand, is a fairly accessible um, form, right? So every teenager in love is a poet, everyone enjoys songs, song lyrics, but you're also an essayist, and essays are usually notoriously dense. And um, there have been, of course, literally, literally discussions on your work, and I saw a subreddit on your poems. Uh, you're a professor and a creative writer, so I really wanted to know how you balance the creative and the academic. Do you think they feed off of each other? Do they further each other? Do you like keeping them separate? How do you go about that? Yeah, I mean, I, for an academic, I'm not a very good one in, that, in the conventional sense. You know, um, uh, my wife is, a, is also an academic, um, also a professor, um, and she's the kind of, person you would expect, you know, can read like nine different languages, has this, you know, massive library of like Greek and Latin books, all this sort of thing. Um, she's also very, got a wonderful sense of humor and is very down to earth. Um, but she did the work, you know, she did her master's at Harvard and she went to Brown for a PhD. And, and that's what I think of when I think of academic and scholar, somebody who um, you know, learned German and Latin and Greek and, and uh, she, she even, studied I think Sanskrit and all kinds of things like and um and I don't do those things <laughs> you know I um I feel much more um uh pragmatic in some ways and and that might be the consequence of um having uh, immigrant parents you know where a lot of our decisions in this country are by necessity they have to be pragmatic and so as much as you'd love to be uh, the professor with the with the pipe and the tweed jacket, and you went to Harvard and you studied in the library. Um, uh, we couldn't do those things, you know. First, we didn't; they didn't really let us in, and then um, <laughs> it, it felt unnatural. And so, I was never that kind of um, uh, person. And I also, I think maybe this is what makes me a poet: is that I, I don't always have the attention span required you know, to, uh, to sit and do that kind of study. I'm always curious about, well, what's that over there and how does that work with this? So when I was in, in classes and I did perfectly well in school um, and I had these, you know, advanced classes, I, I was always more interested when I would go into my AP um, European history class and then I'd go into my AP art history class. I, I would, and then I'd go into the chemistry class. I would realize, wait a minute, all these things are happening at the same time. This, development in chemistry is happening at the same time as this development in art, and, and that's happening at the same time as the French Revolution, there, there must be some connection here. Um, and I became very interested in that, so uh, it became a much sort of more about breadth 
been necessarily about depth and I, I and I, I acknowledge that fully like I, I I don't feel especially deeply studied in any subject but I feel kind of moderately studying a lot of different subjects um, and so that helps me I think to maybe get that some of that balance where um, I have a very sincere interest in scholarship and academia but I don't want to devote my life to just one subject and reading you know um, universally or comprehensively on that subject um, and and I think that is what then comes out in the writing where there are references to science and history and, and language and food and culture and music um, and so the and the essays I think um, were very much born in the same place I didn't they're not very scholarly essays. They're very much more personal kinds of um, style of writing. And yet there is an analytic aspect to them because I did study philosophy and, and I do know how to kind of create an argument and present it. Um, but I didn't love that style of writing that we encounter in philosophy. And so, which doesn't permit for very personal kinds of um, uh, perspectives. And so what I try to do in the essays is begin from the personal and then make an analysis from there. And I think that helps find the balance. Uh, well, actually, that is something I noticed in uh, both your poems and your essays. They're very, they draw from experience, they're very sensory, often sensual. Um, a lot has been said about the musicality of your verses anyway. They're usually laden with visual imagery. So how did that come to be? Is that something you cultivated in your writing because you enjoy reading that? Um, which texts, which kind of texts have shaped your writing? Um, what are your favorite books? Uh, yeah, no, I, I, it is. It's, I, 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 my engagement with poetry is um, very, uh, po you know, modernist, postmodernist. I don't have, um, I, I like some of the older English poets uh, a little bit here and there, some Wordsworth, some Keats. Um, I never got, I was never one of these devotees to like Byron or Shelley, um, uh, Dickinson and Whitman, you know, okay, I don't love them, I think they're okay, but once um, poetry in the West hits uh, the modernist period with imagism, that suddenly made a lot more sense to me with um, Hilda Doolittle and um, Ezra Pound, another horrible person, but an important figure in poetry, um, this sort of drive William Carlos Williams and Wallace Stevens, these people, their poetry, and, and I don't know much about them as humans. Again, this is like another testament to the way in which my, my scholarship is limited. I never studied biographies and things like that. And so I'm always startled when somebody says, oh, well, Wallace Stevens was a racist. And I say, I, I had literally had no idea, but I know his poems. Um, and I found these poems to be very descriptive, um, and, and as the name suggests, imagism presents imagery. And it's this idea that I think William Carlos Williams may have said, um, no ideas but in things, right? That poetry should not be um, an art of symbolism where, you know, like a math equation you have to solve. Oh, well, the person used the color green over here. That stands for this other thing. And, uh, you know, there's a bird in this stanza and that bird stands for you know, religious faith, I, I never enjoyed that. What I liked was um, description that felt vivid to me and does still feel vivid to me and it locates me somewhere um, and, and kind of puts me in a different perspective than my own. Um, and some of the poets who um, have been very important to me in that respect, um, I'll just name a couple, uh, you know, a, a person I always cite, although he only has one book um, and he passed away last year, um, but David Berman has this book, he's an American poet, um, he has a book called Actual Air that I just remember reading in college and fell in love with, as many people did, it's not like an obscure book necessarily. Um, there's another poet in college, Mary Rufel, who is really important to me um, and her work uh, still is very important to me. Um, and um, James Tate was another uh, writer who was very much a, a, a poet with a sense of humor um, and has just a, a wonderfully bizarre idea of the world in his mind is 
so much wonderfully more refreshing and also more depressing in some ways than the world um, that we, we all share. Um, and so I love that kind of interiority of some of these um, writers. And then more recently, um, one of my, you know, one of my favorite poets and, and a friend um, is, is Jericho Brown, who has recently, you know, gotten a, a lot of deserved attention. He won the Pulitzer Prize here in the States um, just this year. Um, but a very different kind of uh, vantage point than those other uh, poets that I mentioned. But Jericho is another one who I think I was so thrilled that he did win this award because his poetry is is so sensual. It is so vivid. He writes about radically different things than I do, but um, but we come from the same sort of aesthetic, I think, place of describe the thing and then describe your feelings via that thing. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think I try to emulate, you know, some mix of all of that, um, sensuality and, and strangeness and vividness. Um, those are all very important to me. And um, how do you deal with writer's blocks and how do you keep your creative faculty stimulated, especially during the pandemic? And what are you working on now? Um, well, I mean, writer's block, there is always the, the easiest, simplest solution to writer's block is to go and read something. You know, um, you simply cannot break out of writer's block if you are going to sit and stare at a blank page. Um, there are times at which you will and you should get sick of your own voice. Um, this morning I, I uh, woke up at quarter after six and I couldn't fall back asleep. Um, our, our baby, almost two years old, he was asleep, so I could have slept for once, but um, I couldn't fall back asleep. And I actually remember thinking around 7.30, like I'm so sick of this voice in my head. I wish it would just be quiet and I could just sleep, you know? Um, and, and often I feel like writer's block comes from the same place, that you get stuck in your own head, you get stuck in your own voice. And I think the reason that happens, I, I, I've never written about this, and this may be the first time I'm trying to articulate it, so forgive me if it's very clumsy, but, um, but I actually think that writer's block is born of egotism in some strange way. I think that you start to think about all of the things around writing, and they prevent you from doing the actual writing. You start to worry about, well, how is a reader going to accept this? Who's going to publish this? Am I going to, you know, be a failed writer or a successful writer? And, and you start to think about everything but the words. You know, you start to think about everything but the language. You start to think about ideas. Oh, I'm going to write this amazing, the, the, you know, the great American uh, immigrant novel. I'm going to write, you know, a, a 20 poem sequence that deals with, they were all about Charles Darwin or, you know, you come up with these grandiose ideas um, and they're always grandiose, you know, and then you sit down and nothing comes out. And, um, and then from there you start to panic, you start to feel anxious and you think, oh my God, what's wrong with me? And then it all locks down. So the thing that is wonderful about reading as a cure for writer's block is that reading can be very humbling. You know, it, it removes you from your own subjective position and puts you into somebody else's story. And, um, and when that happens, uh, remarkably, um, things start to kind of shake loose. And I think the reason they shake loose is because your ego finally gets tamped down a little bit and you begin to once again pay attention to the words, to the language itself. And you start to kind of become impressed with somebody else's language. And then you remember, oh, I want to try that. You know, and then you sit down and you start to imitate. Um, and then, it, you know, imitation is impossible. You may try, but it never quite works out. And suddenly you have this um, very original uh, story or poem of your own. Um, and beyond that, through the pandemic, I am, I am writing. We, we don't have childcare like many people. And so we're trying to work, um, splitting up the day where I take care of the baby for, you know, for the morning and my wife takes care of them for the afternoon and that buys us each a couple of hours to work and then fortunately he has right around the time the pandemic started and the lockdowns began he started sleeping wonderfully like we would put him down at 7 30 and he would just go to sleep and that's been the case so you know fingers crossed it stays that way um so once he's in bed um i try to do emails and work stuff 
during the day and then in the evening um, I'll stay up and, and write um, which is costing me sleep but I'm, I'm still I'm working on a fourth book of poetry um, and I you know I'm maybe about two-thirds of the way finished with it and um, and I don't know yet what it'll be called or what the structure or anything like that I'm just trying to write as much as I can when I can and, and so keep moving you know yeah. Good luck on that. We're really <laughs> looking forward to reading it soon, hopefully. And um, well, my last question to you is more of a request, actually. Um, could you perhaps um, read us a poem of yours? Anyone that you like? Um, sure. And um, this, I, I, uh, I'm going to read it off of my computer. So I don't know what this will look like on Zoom. It might look kind of disembodied and strange, but, um, okay. but I'm going to read a poem <clears throat> from the 44th of July um, and it's called the bar poem and it, it that it's called that because it takes place um, in a bar and um, you know I've, I've spent uh, a lot of hours in bars because as a writer I would go to a coffee shop a cafe for decades now I've done this and would write um, this is before I was married before I had children um, or had a child um, no, no, no children right now. Just one is good. Um, but uh, and then when the when the cafe would close, I would um, you know everywhere I've ever lived, I found some quiet bar where there's you know often hardly anybody in there, and I would sit in the back and I would write. And eventually, over time, you get to be friends with the people who are around. Um, and even if you're not like drinking heavily or you know partying like other people are, you get in conversations. And I have been in a lot of very um, silly conversations in, in bar rooms with drunk people who have theories about this and people are arguing. And you, I also overhear it a lot. You know, if you're sitting in the corner writing, you overhear people arguing about just ridiculous stuff. Um, so this poem is born of that experience of hearing people arguing. Um, and so the poem kind of has its own little argument. Um, uh, and that's where it picks up in the middle of an argument. So the bar poem. And if it turns out Lahore is at the proximate center of a cloud-shaped multiverse, every universe a droplet, every moth in Punjab the mortal flicker of an other life, if there's an other life, this trig and Nova show just a third or thirty-third expansion of a boundless quantum mud, and there aren't any mountain spirits, no papacy or patron saints logging our masturbations, you mulling boneheaded sermons in erroneous temples, me resting on the wrong day, pleading at an incoherent altar. And if the space gurus arrive curing unemployment and angst, if they confirm the definitive merits of deregulation, but also the indispensable covenant of a social safety net, if they affirm Otis Redding is better than the Beatles or the Stones, Bach, pedantic, Lata Mangeshkar more intricate than Ovid, and of course, Anne of Green Gables over Harry Potter, of course, Michael over LeBron, of course, Serena. And yes, the milk past its sell-by date is fine. And no, you don't look fat in those pants. But the gecko tat and tongue stud in 98 were a bad idea. But there's no such thing as 98. And you were wrong about Tupac. Right about kumquats. Wrong about Nietzsche. And if the unearthly uberbenchen arrive in their Jesus-shaped starship to say they've been watching us a long time, that we are critical as paper clips redeemable, but nearer to the apes than the angels. Will you finally put your beer down, Bernardo, settle your tab, and walk the brief hushed blocks home? Oh, nice. That was lovely. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for having me. And a great interview. Thank you so much. I had a great time. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you so much for having Thank me. Much. I appreciate it. Okay.